All right, all right, Red Nation. Look at this image of a radiographer right here, and let me know what's wrong with this image. Here's another one, a little bit closer up. What's wrong with this radiographer right now? Well, she's definitely got a smile on her face. That's a good thing. She's got the lead on, also a good thing. But she's not actually wearing a badge. She doesn't actually have any way to monitor the level of radiation that she's getting over time as part of her job. She's definitely an occupational worker. You can tell by the fact that she's operating the machine. She's got the lead on, so she should really be wearing a badge. A little bit less pretty, but this is an image from a paper where they were doing a study. You want to be wearing a badge at collar level side of the lead. Optionally, you can also have a badge, especially if you're monitoring radiation exposure during pregnancy, which is underneath the lead at the abdomen level. When we talk about radiation exposure, we've had videos on background radiation. It just gives you a framework to understand the relative levels of background radiation in the world. Around two to three millisieverts per year, that's the background radiation. 2.4 is the global average, and closer to three is the average in the United States. But we have separate videos about deterministic and stochastic effects for radiation. We know there are deterministic effects at relatively higher doses for the lens of the eye, namely cataracts. So there's occupational limits based on these deterministic effects of 150 millisieverts per year for the lens of the eye. Additionally, the skin of 500 millisieverts per year and the hands and feet of 500 millisieverts per year for the occupational dose. That's from the ICRP in 2007. More recently, based on analysis of stochastic effects, there's been a recommendation for occupation dose to the eye of 20 millisieverts per year averaged over a five-year period. So it is possible also to have badges which are at eye level and can monitor the radiation dose at eye level. We're going to talk about the different types of badges, namely film badges, PLD badges, and digital badges. This is one of those that could go at eye level. First off, film badges. And you can use the knowledge that you have of how the imaging equipment works to actually relate to how these badges work. The film badges were actually invented during the Manhattan Project to give a way to actually track the radiation dose of the workers during the Manhattan Project as they were developing the nuclear bomb. So if you haven't seen our website, we've got several useful articles on our website. One of these articles is just about the different types of radiation. And if you remember, we have what we call particulate radiation, such as alpha particles. This is like a helium nucleus. Well, if it interacts with a piece of paper, can get stopped by that piece of paper. On the other hand, if you have an electron, it might make it through that piece of paper, but then would have a relatively higher chance of getting stopped by something such as plastic or aluminum foil. Then our x-ray photons, those x-ray photons could actually make it through the paper, make it through the plastic or aluminum foil. But if you had sheet of lead, we could actually do a relatively good job of stopping those x-ray photons. And that's the purpose of the lead that you're actually wearing during the procedures. And then finally, neutrons actually can pass through the paper, the aluminum foil, the lead. You need something relatively large, like actually a big block of water to be a moderator for neutrons. This concept can actually be used when we're monitoring the radiation dose by actually putting filters in front of the badge that we're using. So this is built inside the badge so you don't see it but we can actually use filters of different materials in order to see how much radiation is passing through those filters and thus kind of tease out the effects of electrons, which are called betas, versus x-rays in those different contributions. So a film badge might look something like this, where you see these different filters here, and thus you're actually gonna be looking at the effect of the radiation passing through those filters and then interacting with the film itself. To develop the film, you use the process just like developing your diagnostic films where you're gonna insert your film, it's gonna go through a developer, it's gonna go through a fixer, and it's gonna go through a rinsing and drying cycle. This process is like your imaging films. If we talk about those filters, imagine you have your film right here, 
and you're going to be looking at the interaction of your radiation with the film. So one option that you have is an open area that has no attenuation. The radiation would not be stopped as it goes through there. Then you could have a thin piece of plastic and you're actually going to have less electrons making it through there. So you can get an estimate of the contribution from beta particles by looking at the difference between this no attenuation and this thin piece of plastic. You can then look at thicker plastic and that potentially can stop some very low energy x-rays. Then you can look at some metals such as tin for instance and that can really start to attenuate some of those medium energy x-rays. So you can start to tease out the effect of the medium energy x-rays by looking at the differences of attenuation between that thin plastic and the tin for instance. And then finally you can look at some significant filtration such as cadmium and lead combination. And if you have significant filtration you can really start to attenuate out mostly all of those x-rays and then anything that's making it through still that would be a contribution from neutrons. Advantages of the film badges. They're simple. They're inexpensive. They're reliable. And you can make them sensitive to all those different beta, x-ray, and gamma like we talked about. And disadvantages is that they're not good at measuring extremely low doses. You need to send them away to do the film processing and to do the measurements. They're a one-time use. And because it's actually silver in the film that you're looking at the interactions with, it's actually not directly tissue equivalent because the Z of that is actually higher than your standard tissue in your body. So you have to do some conversions to actually get the dose to be relative to the actual dose that would be in a person. You know, I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison, so I always love to point out the fact when things were developed there and TLDs were actually developed in the 50s at University of Wisconsin-Madison. It could be either calcium sulfate or lithium fluoride, for instance. And in those actual materials, you can think of having a valence band and a conduction band. And in that valence band, you have lots of electrons hanging out here. And then in that conduction band, you have fewer electrons hanging out here but the electrons can get to that conduction band. And we talk about having the ability to trap electrons. The idea is that higher in this little plot here means it has a higher energy. So if you can get an electron up there in that trap, that electron is gonna be trapped with a higher energy. Likewise, a hole or an absence of electron, you could get to a higher energy than this valence band where all these electrons are hanging out. So right off the bat, we say there's no latent energy stored in this state where there's not actually an electron trapped yet in an electron trap. So if the radiation comes in, you can actually have a switch between a hole. So I've drawn a little positive as where that hole was and the electron switched. So now there's an electron trapped in that electron trap when the radiation came in. Likewise, now there's a hole trapped in that hole trap. So that electron and that hole, they now have an elevated amount of energy, or we can say there's latent energy now stored in that lithium fluoride. And the key is that if you have more radiation dose absorbed, that means there's gonna be more electron traps that are filled then we can actually read out those electron traps by actually heating up this material. Thermo has to do with temperature. So as you heat the material, you can actually free the elect from the trap. And as those electrons are freed from the trap, there will actually be light emitted. So they'll fall back to the valence band and then there will be light emitted. So this is what a TLD badge looks like the plastic outer part of the badge. You can also have filters in your TLDs for the same purpose that we talked about having filters in the film badges to differentiate the different types of radiation. And then you'll have your little TLD crystals that can sit behind those filters. You take it to a setup where you're going to have something to actually measure that light. So you'll take your TLD, you'll put it in underneath your photomultiplier tube. You'll provide some heat in the background so that the TLD will get warmed up. Then the TLD light will come out and you'll measure the quantitative light that you're seeing there. You'll 
amplify that light and digitize it. And then that will be the number associated with the radiation which was received at that TLD. Here's just a picture of what this kind of machine would look like from the outside to actually do the reading. Advantages here, again, it's still relatively simple, reliable. It's now more tissue-like because the material has a lower Z, which is closer to actually the Z of your body or the atomic number of your body. Disadvantages is you still need to send away. You don't get a lot of uses out of the TLDs and the actual warming can actually change the property of the crystals. Just like TLDs can actually emit light there's the possibility to have what we call optically stimulated light emission. So an OSLD is very similar to a TLD. The process works just like the TLD at the beginning where the radiation will actually fill traps and those traps will be filled in proportion with how much radiation dose was actually absorbed. Then actually to read out the radiation dose instead of heating, you actually now use optical light so green light will actually come in as that green light interacts you can actually get light produced that then that light will be a separate wavelength that's the property of the osld and this light here is what can be measured this is an example of an osld so during my time i used tlds when i was in madison to monitor my dose and while i've been at ge we've been using osl it sits inside a packet for the badge which also can have filters in the same way that we talked about for the film. These different filters can help separate the effects of the different radiation types. The OSLD readers then will work the same way as the TLD readers, except instead of stimulating the emission by heating the material, now you're stimulating the emission by shining a green laser light on the OSLD, and that OSLD actually will have that green laser light pulsed actually in quick pulses and then the light will actually be read out by an imager and then digitized. And from that digital image, then the calculation or conversion of the radiation dose can be made. Here's what an OSLD reader looks like. So inside is the laser and the imager and you would just load in your OSLD here and then get the readout. Advantages of OSLDs, more sensitive than film, reliable, more tissue-like than film as well, also more reusable than a TLD. Disadvantages of OSLD, you need to send it away still. There's only one vendor as of now, and it's more expensive than film. Digital dosimeters, or also called electronic personal dosimeters. Here's just a couple images of some different options that are available. Inside of them, most use a MOSFET, which is called a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. It is made of silicon dioxide and a semiconductor is kind of halfway in between an insulator and a conductor. And you can actually add different doping materials in order to change the electric properties. And this MOSFET actually has some different types of doping materials that are positioned and then has actually some different voltages that are then applied between these different materials. The current is actually the thing that's of interest as the current between what's called the source and the drain here within this MOSFET. An interesting property of these MOSFETs is that the relationship between the current and the voltage is linear down here in this region. This is like Ohm's law. And then you get to some region here where there's actually a threshold that's reached. And when you reach that threshold, the behavior actually changes and it saturates out and the current does not increase after that point. For the purpose of our use case, the radiation actually can create defects inside of the oxide, then those defects inside the oxide can then change that voltage inside the MOSFET and the changes in that voltage are then proportional to the radiation. In a real time manner, those changes in that threshold voltage can be used to indicate the radiation which has been received. The advantages is in comparison with all the other techniques that we've talked about, it's real-time monitoring, so you don't have to send it away. It benefits 
from scenarios when you have a higher dose rate environment and you'd like to monitor in a more real time what the dose is in these environments. It's tissue-like. Nowadays, it can be Bluetooth capable. They can actually send off the dose to another device and then can be tracked automatically in that manner. Disadvantages is the cost. These are more expensive than any one of the technologies that I've talked about so far. This is from both an upfront cost and then also a replacement cost. So if you as a technologist lose one of these, then you would have a replacement cost for this device. You're now familiar with personal dosimetry, the ways you can measure the dosimetry using these radiation badges. But do you know within an x-ray room, actually which is the biggest source of radiation that you have to be concerned with? See our video on that coming up.